What you laughing at? So I'm Carlisle. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want you to know how dedicated I am to all of you and to the ministry of Jesus Christ. My wife and I quested for this, even the back. We went from Walmart to Walmart and found this on sale for $15 with a matching tie. Just want you to know it's not, thank you, thank you. It's not an outfit because I don't wear outfits. I just wear clothes because these are not new. This is just a jacket with a tie. I don't get hairdos. I get haircuts. Um, I learned two things about polyester. Um, one uh, on the news that polyester never rots. So this jacket is my jacket for eternity. <laughs> $15 and eternity. The other thing I learned for service is that it doesn't breathe very well. So I got a, got a little paper towel in my pocket just in case. So I apologize if if um, something happens while I'm letting this not breathe. So here's the thing. This jacket, if you know me, you're not surprised, right? I mean, even my socks have color. It's just kind of the real me. People said they were shopping around and they saw jackets like this and they thought of me. So I know that you're not surprised because uh, people say, Carlisle, you can get away with that. And I do. I get away with that because all it tells me two things. One, you just don't have the guts, dudes. You just don't have the guts. To, um, you could do it if you wanted to. That's all I'm saying. And it's just kind of the real me. I, li I like to be kind of weird that way um, in other ways too. But that's just the real me. I don't like to hold back on some things. I just kind of let me be me. But that's a question I want to ask you. The real you, who is the real you, the whole you, the powerful you, the effective you, the kind and the gentle you, the loving you, the powerful you? the changing the world you. If you really were the you that you wanted to be, what would that you be? The best version of you. Weird jacket and all, whatever your thing is. That's uh, kind of a big question. It's a question that people have asked for eons, for lots and lots of years, for thousands and thousands of years and generations upon generations. They've been asking these questions about themselves and asking the questions about their surroundings. And they have this suspicion that I want to talk with you two about, about tonight, that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. They're, things in our world are not the way they're supposed to be. Things in our nation are not the way they're supposed to be. Things in my neighborhood are not really the way they're supposed to be. Things in my home are not the way they're supposed to be. And dang it, things in me and my soul are not the way they're supposed to be. I was talking to a friend just a couple of weeks ago. Their family's going through some stuff, some stuff. And we, I was trying to encourage her, and she said, it shouldn't be this hard. And then the next day, something else happened to them that they had to trudge through. We know that it shouldn't be this hard. We're suspicious that it's supposed to be better than this, and that even with me, I'm supposed to be better than this. And maybe you're like me. Maybe when I think about the best version of me and the actual version of me, all I really do is go get glitzy, ostentatious jackets and put on the outside because I'm really just trying to cover up my inadequacy and how I know that I'm not the best that I'm supposed to be, what I'm designed to be. Even at Christmas, sorry for the downer, we'll try to pick it up a little bit. Even as we come to Christmas and you're going to leave here, you look all Christmassy, good job, especially you. Now you know why I liked your shirt when you walked in. Yeah, got a little kindred spirit over there. You look all Christmassy, you're going to go home and do your Christmas stuff, and we have fun, and we celebrate, and then the day after tomorrow, when we start figuring out when we're going to take all our Christmas decorations down, and life starts to get back to the way that life is, and we have the same question that my friend had, it shouldn't be this hard, should it? Weren't we made for more than this? Weren't things supposed to be better than this? Wasn't I supposed to be better than this? And so as we start to think those things, we realize that we actually do need saved from something. We need saved from the world around us. And we need saved from ourselves. We all have that sense. And so we're all looking for ways to get saved. Just like that question that's been asked for generations, so is this question. Isn't there something better, and isn't there something that can save me? And that's where religions start to come in. 
exploring religions is what we've been doing on Sunday mornings at our church, at Journey Church, for the last few weeks. We've been looking at the way people, finite people like you, finite people like me, are contemplating an infinite God and trying to make sense of this life that we thought should be better than this, and they go to religion to do that. And we're comparing and looking at exploring different religions and how they see Jesus. We've looked at Mormonism, we've looked at Islam, this next week we're going to look at Jehovah's Witnesses, the week after that some, some Buddhism, and we're looking at Jesus in comparison. And tonight that's what we're going to look at is Jesus. Without getting into what we've covered the last two weeks, because we don't have time for that tonight, and tonight do the spoiler alert for the next two weeks, we hope that you'll come for that. There's a formula that, that we've discovered as we've looked at these. The formula is this, for to get salvation you do things and you get saved. That's the formula that we keep seeing in religions. You do things, and then you get saved. If you're kind enough, you could get saved. If you give enough money to good causes, causes bigger than you, uh, you could get saved. If you never talk back to your parents, uh, probably you could get saved. If you're only snarky with your spouse one time a week, just once, you can get away with that. You're probably okay. And if you only lose, like, uh, use the low to mid-range, like 1 to 10 scale, 1 to 5 cuss words, not 6 to 10 cuss words, you're probably okay, right? Pro probably? Maybe? I don't know. Uh, I just think that I would not do well, even on just the cuss word thing, because I'm never snarky to my wife, because why would I be? She's perfect. But like the six to ten words, when you guys cut me off in traffic this week, that might have come up. That's all I'm saying. And I don't know how I would rate. If my salvation depends on me doing things to get saved, I'm a little scared. It's an exhausting proposition. This whole religion thing is an exhausting proposition. The suspicion that things should be better exhausts me. But then if I'm thinking about things should be better and I should be better, I should do better, and then I get a formula like this from religion, that if I do things, I get saved, that even exhausts me more. It makes me want to throw up my hands because I know that some days I'm just not good enough. I just don't know if I'll ever stack up on that salvation thing. And I'm just talking about the six to 10 cuss words. I'm not talking about the other stuff. Christianity, it's different. Christianity is, has a whole different formula. It, it starts with the same suspicion that there's someone or something bigger and better and that there's someone in here that's bigger and better. But instead of doing things to get saved, the Christian formula is this, get saved and then do things. You get saved, we'll talk about that in a second, which then inspires you to do things differently than you did before. Do you see the order is totally rearranged? So to get saved in Christianity, it starts with belief. And we're celebrating that belief at Christmas time. And by the way, the whole world is acknowledging Jesus. Even if they don't mean to, they're acknowledging Jesus today and tomorrow. And faith starts with salvation, starts with believing that God said, yeah, Carlisle, I did intend for something bigger and better for you, and you're not hitting that mark, but instead of doing things to get saved, I'm going to make amends, and I'm going to give Jesus my son, and he's going to make things better with you and for you. And I believe that, and that's how I get my salvation, by belief, and then I start to do things. The thing about that salvation formula, though, is, is that Jesus came to save us for eternity, like my jacket, it's going to be with me for eternity because polyester never dies. But it's not just eternity that God is concerned about. He's concerned about the rest of today. When you leave here and go have your really healthy interactions with your family that you didn't want to come tonight, or tomorrow morning or the next week when you go back to work, all those things, he wants to affect that part of your life, not just the eternity part, but the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this whole year part. That's why Jesus came, not just for eternity. Jesus came for your today and your tomorrow. He came to have a relationship with you. And that's one of the things that's different in this formula from other religions, that Jesus didn't just come and leave. The other religions, that's what they tend to do. They all have an icon. They all have a, a savior, an agent, some guy, some person that saves them. But that person came and went. The difference between that, those religions and the religion with Jesus 
is that Jesus, the salvation bringer, didn't come for a while and leave. He came for a while and stayed. He has a relationship with me, an ongoing one. He can have a relationship with you, ongoing. He travels with us. He lives life with us. He didn't come and then go. He came and he stayed. When the Bible speaks about Jesus at Christmas time, there's a word, a name, Emmanuel. Do you know what that word means? God, this thing, this person that we are suspicious about all of our lives that we're created in the image of, God with us. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Not just for eternity, but for your today and for your tomorrow. So in a moment, I'm going to read a passage to you from Matthew. It's not a Christmas passage. You might think it odd as I start reading it to you that we would be discussing this passage in chapter 11 because isn't the Christmas story at the beginning of the Gospels? So I'm going to read it to you because Jesus has an intention in his relationship with you. But before I read this contemporary translation uh, from the Message Bible, a little different from the NIV that we usually do, I want you to stop thinking about stuff. So the whole Instapot thing, it's at home. It's Instapotting right now. So let it go. Let it do its thing. Those presents that you're going to go wrap that you still haven't wrapped, it'll be there when you get home. It'll be there at 1 in the morning when you still haven't got to it. Uh, let's think about that at 1 in the morning. Right now, let's take a Christmas breath together. And let's listen to these words. Quit thinking about those things that you get to go do or that you have to go do. And just listen to this passage. Listen to Jesus. He's the one who spoke this. Listen to this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Would you pray with me? And we'll talk more about that. Jesus, we thank you that you're different, that you are the ultimate salvation bringer, and that it's not just for the future that you're saving us, but it's for our now that you're saving us. And you do that through a relationship. So help us to gain a perspective on you tonight. Help us to gain a perspective on ourselves tonight. And help us to gain a perspective on you and ourselves walking together through life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So when I read the Bible and I read a passage like that, I've been asking myself three questions each time I read it. I'm going to go through those questions with you. Here's the, here are the questions. First one, what does this say about our world? When I read scripture, what does this say about our world? And then I ask, how does this bring meaning to my life? And the third question, how does this shape then the way I'm going to live? So I'm going to answer those three questions the way I see them happening to me. And I think because we're all kind of in the same boat, except you wouldn't wear a jacket like this, we're in the same boat when it comes to this eternity thing and this living life, thinking that it shouldn't be this hard. So the first question is this, what does this say about our world? This is what I think it says about our world. We're all tired of the way things are, and we are seeking some relief. That's what Jesus started off saying. This is what it said. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? This is what I imagine him continuing to say. Carlisle, are you tired of wondering when it's going to get better? Carlisle, are you tired of trying to be good enough? by doing things on your own and relying on that to get saved? Carlisle, are you tired of trying to keep up with all the religious to-do lists because of those six to ten cuss words that you used this week? I am tired. Are you tired? I'm tired. I actually am tired. I emailed someone yesterday. We're going to go see some friends tomorrow in Mesa to spend some Christmas dinner with them. And they're trying to work up this whole who's bringing what thing. And I just don't have time. I made a cheesecake, but they wanted more. And I said, we'll do our best. I'll bring some leftovers from communion tonight. Do something like that. <laughs> and they emailed back and said, we understand you're tired and that you're busy and that, that, that Christmas is a busy time for pastors and churches. 
I don't have time to do all the things. I'm excited. You know, as I think about the things that I'm tired, maybe the things that you're tired about, and I think about the, the good side, like the six to 10 good, the one to five bad, I think I have a bunch of six to 10 stuff this week. I think. But I know there's some one to five stuff too. And honestly, I'm too tired to evaluate. I'm just too tired. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. I know. So are you tired, worn out, burned out in religion? Let's try something new, Carlisle. And this is what he goes on to say. Second question, what meaning does this bring to my life? As I live with Jesus, I still get to be me. As I live with Jesus, I still get to be me. First part of the next part of the scripture says, come to me. I want to explain this analogy that Jesus was using for his audience. It's a farming analogy. It's where we say, take my yoke upon me. That's upon you. That's what Jesus says. Take my yoke, Jesus, upon you. Carlisle, a yoke, if you know what a yoke is, it's a piece of wood. It's a farming implement that puts two horses or two oxen together, and it carves out a section for their head and their neck, and they strap together, and they do the work together. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, let, let's yoke up. Let's pair up together this life that is so hard for you. Let's do it together. There's another way to think about it. When I was in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, me and Rod Hunter had the record, and that was like uh, 35 years ago. I'm pretty sure the record still stands for the three-legged race on field day. <laughs> yeah, we were that fast. We strapped our legs together, and we were in such unison that we set the record, and no one could ever catch us for years. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, Carlisle, let's do the three-legged race through your life. Let's pair up. Let's yoke up together. He goes on and says, get away with me and you'll recover your life. Jesus is saying, Carlisle, I know who you're supposed to be because I'm Jesus. I'm the creator. I'm God. I made you. I know who I made you to be. So why don't you let me help you get back to that guy? that guy that I wanted you to be in the first place, let's do that. He goes on and says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Carlisle, the more that you are you, the more that you are the person I made you to be will actually provide rest for your soul. The more you try to be something that I didn't design you to be, a person I didn't even want you ever to be, is not rest for your soul. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Let me be me, Jesus says, and you be you, Carlisle. He goes on and says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. I picture him saying, hey, let's yoke up, Carlisle. Let's yoke up together, you and me. And as we're yoking up together in this life that you think is so hard, watch me as you go. As we're doing this thing, watch me. And then he says that great line. I love the line. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Carlisle, you can be you, and I'll be me. Let's do that. I'm Jesus. You're not. You pair up with me. I still get to be Jesus. You still get to be Carlisle. And there'll be something really cool and really unique as you yoke up with me. And that whole grace thing, I know you're going to have those six to ten episodes in your life. When you mess up, because we're yoked together, I'm still going to walk with you, and you'll fail forward. We'll keep moving forward together. That's what I picture Jesus saying to me. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, he says. So Carlisle, that jacket you wore that one Christmas Eve, you can still do stuff like that. You can still wear those, those crazy things. You can still be you. That jacket that fits you, fits your body, that jacket that fits your soul, you can be you. I'll be me, and you be you, and let's do this life thing together. Third question, how does this shape the way I live my life? Your life is an outcome of your lifestyle. Big line. I think that's a huge line. Your life is an outcome of your lifestyle. He says this, keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Carlisle, take a look at your lifestyle. Carlisle, take a look at my lifestyle. Let's bring that together. I'm Jesus. Watch my lifestyle and see if you can take some things on to your, your lifestyle. I think at Christmas time, even though this is not a Christmas passage, as we end the year and start a new year of our life, this is a great passage 
to think about. We think about Jesus more and more at Christmas time, but let's not stop. He says, hey, watch my lifestyle and start mimicking that. Have you ever thought about this line? My life is an outcome of my lifestyle. That makes me a little uncomfortable. You know, I'd like to think that the, the, the thing that I would see is like muscles and not tumors. What do we do with tumors? We cut them off. I don't want my life to have evidence of tumors. I want life to be muscular with, with Jesus. And I think that's what he's asking us to do with him. He wants us to take on his lifestyle. So I have a challenge for all of us here. I like to do the whole one to 10 pendulum swing and thing to compare things. I think all of us here tonight with this whole Jesus relationship thing are on this pendulum. If one, if we say at one end of the scale is you've heard of Jesus, you have. If you've never heard of him before, you've heard of him tonight. And so that would be a one. You just kind of know about this Jesus guy. A 10 would be someone who never has six to 10 cuss words their whole life. And so you're somewhere, you're all somewhere in between there, between a 1 and a 10. So what are we going to do tonight? So here's what I want you to think about. No matter where you are on that 1 to 10 scale, I bet you that there's some people here that are on the 1 to 5 section where you've heard about Jesus and this whole thing I said about faith, belief in Jesus, we get that first and then our life starts to change. Maybe that's where you are. You don't have faith in Jesus yet. He's just a a dude that you've heard about. So let's start there. Let's talk about the one to five. The rest of us on the six to 10, this is for you too. This challenge is for all of us. All of us can agree, no matter what number we are on that one to 10 scale, that Jesus and his lifestyle has stood the test of time. All people, all places, and all times since Jesus has lived agree about Jesus. All religions do. That Jesus and his lifestyle is a good thing. It's a good lifestyle to mimic. It's a good lifestyle to follow. It's a good lifestyle to emulate. You can't go wrong by following Jesus. You just can't. He stood the test of time, and all cultures and all religions agree with that. You can't go wrong following Jesus, even if you're not quite ready to believe and place faith in Jesus. So I have a challenge for us. No matter where you are on that 1 to 10 scale, seek Jesus out. Look at his lifestyle. Consider what Jesus' lifestyle is. And there's an easy way to do that. In the New Testament, the first four books in the New Testament, we refer to them as the gospel. They're all about Jesus' life. So take a gander at Jesus' life. And as you read about Jesus' life, look for his lifestyle. He lived life. It was real. He has a lifestyle and say, huh, that's Jesus' lifestyle. Maybe that's a lifestyle that I can start to adopt, no matter where you are on that 1 to 10 scale. But I have a warning. If you're in that 1 to 10, the 1 to 5 section, watch out, because Jesus changes lives. If you understand him and seek him out and seek understanding of him, he'll change your life. That's what salvation is about, believing in Jesus for eternity and then following him in your day-to-day life. So here's the challenge. Uh, We're going to have a series starting in January where we're going to look at the gospel and how the gospel can challenge our our lives. So you can consider that. But today, here's a thing that you can do. Read the gospels. Start tomorrow and look at Jesus' lifestyle. And if you don't have a Bible, guess what? We have complimentary Bibles on the table that you walked by as you came in, out there where the candles were. It's complimentary. Do you know what that means? Free. You get to just take it. We have some for you. So if you don't have a Bible, take a Bible and start to look at Jesus' lifestyle and let that shape your lives. So we're going to end our service in just a moment with lighting some candles. That's a nice Christmassy tradition that we do. It makes us all feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, The smell of burning wax makes us feel close to Jesus, something like that. So we're going to do that. We're going to do the Christmas tradition thing. But I want to attach some meaning to it tonight. So you're just not lighting a candle and going on your merry way. Do you remember... The word that I said describes Jesus at Christmas time in the Bible, Emmanuel. Do you remember what I said that word means? God with us. Jesus came to be with us. Jesus came for you to be with him. So in a moment as you light this candle, this is a symbol of you looking at that light, looking at Jesus. In Matthew 11, it goes on to say, he is the light of the world. So as you look at that candle and ponder that, ponder Jesus and what he came to do for you. 
we light that candle as a symbol that God is here among us, God with us, Emmanuel. And he says, you get to be you. Let me be Jesus.